I am so glad to be with all of you this morning. Um, we have a lot of announcements. <clears throat> For a small church, we are busy. Just saying, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just we've got stuff going on. So just a little um, announcement for young adult small group. We will not meet again until uh, January um, for study anyway. And we'll have some other things happening in the midst of all that. But just... Keep that in mind. Midweek Bible study is not meeting this week um, because Pete and I will be in Washington State. Yay! <laughs> yes, yes, so we're excited. Today is Harvest Picnic, so if you have not signed up, please let us know because um, I don't want to run out of hot dogs. You never want to run out of hot dogs, so um, let us know uh, today uh, after service if you did not sign up. Also, I'll make sure that you bring some lawn games and some chairs, um, especially the lawn games because those are super fun. Um, and we have a little fire pit to maybe do a few s'mores for those s'mores lovers and that kind of thing. So, um, Also, uh, Women's Bible Study is starting on October 10th. And that is starting, it's going to be at 6 o'clock. So please sign up in the back if you ladies would like to join us so that we kind of know how many to prepare for. Also in the back, we have a sign up for choir. We need to know who's gonna come for Christmas choir because we, Alice needs to do some planning. So if you could please let us know if you're gonna be part of that choir, that's also in the back. And th those rehearsals will begin October 23rd. So keep that in mind. Next week, we will be having three new members come into the, our midst. Praise God. And so please, uh, please be here. Tell people to be here to welcome those folks officially into our midst. Um, and um, we're going to also next week have World Communion Day. So that's going to be a really, I think, a really moving service of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And the idea that around the world, Christians are doing that very same thing on that day. So that's pretty great. Also, uh, next week, CPW is meeting. 
And we have a special speaker, Holly Smith. She works with um, organizations that help with rescue people from human trafficking. And so we're gonna have her come and speak to us. Um, so women, please, uh, please join us for that. And of course, as always, we will be eating together. And then last but not least, save the date. Trunk or treat is coming. And we're gonna have a little fall festival along with that. So please let Jackie Tao know if you could help kind of set up for that and uh, plan for that, because we're gonna make that a, a little bit more, um, a, a little more extended, expanded, I should say, um, than we did last year. So, and you, you wanna be there because you don't know what Pete and I will dress up as. So, there's that. All right, and then, um, oh yes, this is actually something I need to make sure we mention. Um, next weekend, William and Francis Holt will be celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and of course, their 90th birthdays. Why don't, why don't we just do the party all together and get it all done? Um, so. I hope there's cake. If there's not cake, that's fine. I'll still come. But we, uh, that's going to be next Saturday um, on October 5th from 2 to 4. And um, the check your email. All of the information, address information is in there. So your weekly email has that. All righty. Let us quiet our hearts. Dearest Lord, we come to you humbled that we get to come into your midst and worship you. God, give us what we need to worship you well. And Lord, prepare our hearts for what you might share with us today. Open our ears and our eyes that we may see and hear you in this time and help us to leave changed. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty. And let us rise for our first song.
that time in our service uh, where we celebrate giving. Um, and it's my prayer for all of us that as we give in whatever ways we can, whether it's financially or of our abilities, our resources of any kind, that we will sense the presence of God in that. Our verse for this month has been this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us receive our offering now.
Honestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands.
Well, what can I say? It's time to pray. We all have things on our hearts today, don't we? If you've watched the news this morning, you probably have a few thousand more to pray about. Today, though, <clears throat> I would like to take this time in prayer. Of course, we lift up what we have on our hearts, but I want to specifically lift up the fact that our God still reigns. And as believers, we believe that, don't we? We have to stand in that, don't we, as believers in this world, because there are a whole lot of people that are getting brought down by the news and by the things going on in our world. And we have to stand in the gap as a way, as a, as a, in a way, because we carry a spirit and we carry the truth that our God is in control and we need to celebrate that. So, as we go to prayer, lift up who and what is on your heart, but we're going to use this time as a prayer of celebration to our God. Most loving and eternal God, our Father, God the Son, <clears throat> Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, we celebrate you today. We thank you that you are in control and that you chose to live in the hearts of people, that we might carry you wherever we go. So, Holy Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for your beautiful plan. Jesus, we praise you, and we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. God, we thank you what, for what you have been doing in this church, in the hearts of people. Thank you for meeting us in our need. And God, <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we worship you today knowing that it is you who imparts the grace we need to do each day to follow Jesus each day. We celebrate <clears throat> with William and Francis. We celebrate 70 years, Lord. We celebrate that our daughter is getting married this week. We celebrate that we have beautiful people in our lives. We celebrate that we have family and friends. We celebrate because you have given us all good things. And you are worthy to be celebrated today. Lord, when we feel least like celebrating, stir in us. And may the world see our celebration not as something that comes out of denial, but out of something that comes out of a faith in a big God, a great God, the King of all kings. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Time for the kiddos to come on up.
Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I like it. I like it. That's a celebration. As Pastor Karen said, we should celebrate being here. We're all here. Um, well, I'm so glad everyone's here this morning. Good morning, sir. Um, so I wanted to talk to y'all today because there's been a lot going on this week. Do y'all know, um, if you watch the weather, do you know what happened this week? What came? Uh, so a flood. Yeah, a little bit in some places. And also there was like a big flood like like at the roller coasters. And I, when it finally dried out, um, they had to close it because the damages on the roller coasters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Yeah, welcome. Oh, you got light up shoes. That would be helpful in a storm. Light up shoes. We'd see you. So, yeah, this week there was a big storm. It's called a hurricane. And it came up. And it was damaging on the coast, but also it worked up in through multiple states. Like, I had friends and family in multiple states that were affected by this storm. It's real scary. If you see some of the videos and stuff, there was a lot, hey, there's a lot of flooding and just like complete roads washed away. People can't get out. People are stranded. Yeah, serious. Like, where were we last week? Were we in the mountains? Yeah. There are people that are stranded because the roads out have completely washed away because there was just so much flooding. But here's the thing. Even in the storms, what do we, where should our hope be? Storms that are physical, but also storms of life. Where should our hope be? Caleb? In heaven. In heaven, yes. Did you have something you were going to say? Okay. Well, I'm going to read y'all two separate verses here. So, in Psalm 23, which Miss Jean focused on Psalm 23, I believe, this time last year and into early of this year. But do you remember it says in verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's right, in the dark. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, it's talking about the Lord is with us in those storms, but not just the physical storms that we can see, but the storms of life. Like if you have a test and you're really stressed about it, God's with you. He's going to see you through it. If you trust in him, if you do the preparation, you do what you're supposed to. And even if it doesn't go that way, he's going to be with you, right? He'll help yep. you figure it out. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, this next verse is in Psalm 27. It's verse 4, and it's one of my favorites. It says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that, I, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And that's like what Pastor Karen was talking about, that we are going to celebrate the Lord. We're going to celebrate that we get to be here, that we have blessings of life. Hold on. And that God is with us through all those situations and that he see, sees us through, that we seek him in every moment and he will see us through, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Because God is always with you. Amen, amen. I did that. Yeah. Yeah, God is with you. Yeah. All right. Does anybody want to pray for us? All right. Well, then I will pray for us, okay? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for protecting us. We pray for those who have been affected by the storms. Lord, we pray for every situation that everyone here is going through, whether it be known or unknown. Lift them up, Lord. Encourage us through your word and help us to dwell in your house all the days of our lives. For it is in your almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.
ruler on the roof. Sounds crazy, no? But here in our little village of Anatevka, you might say every one of us is a fiddler on the roof, trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. It isn't easy. You may ask, why do we stay up there if it is so dangerous? Well, we stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition. Tradition, tradition. Tradition, 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 tradition. Because of our traditions, we've kept our balance for many, many years. Here in Anatevka, we have traditions for everything. How to sleep, how to eat, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you, I don't know. But it's a tradition. And because of our traditions, every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. Tradition, 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 tradition. The Bible has many traditions, many feasts that the Jews were invited to celebrate. Now, it says there is about seven, but over the years, something along the lines of 17 more were added. Now, there are recommendations, but they aren't necessarily Back in those days, they were necessarily uh, celebrated. God commanded that they would be celebrated. And so the Jewish people did such a thing. They celebrated those different um, traditions. Why? Why do you think God would have them celebrate those? Well, it's an act of worship, isn't it? It's also a way of maintaining balance, as Tevya said in Fiddler on the Roof, a way of maintaining balance in their lives. It also reminded them and us who we are. We belong to God. We are Christ followers. Celebration helps us remember those things. So today, we are going to dig in a little bit to what King David saw as important to worship to God. We're going to 2 Samuel 6, 12 to 23. <clears throat> Now David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So God went to bring up the, so David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. <clears throat> when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord 
and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half-naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. <clears throat> David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Wow. <clears throat> what a story. You can kind of see it, can't you? Well, a little bit of background. What happened prior to our passage today is that <clears throat> David had decided it was time to bring the ark of God into the holy city, into the city of David, Jerusalem. And so <clears throat> he had made plans to take it from Abinadab's home. Now, the ark had been in Abinadab's home for 20 years. So his children grew up with it in their home. And so... They placed it on a brand new cart. And Abinadab's two sons, Uzzah and Ahio, were responsible for moving it. And of course, there were worshipers. It was a party. It really was a great celebration because the Ark of the Lord was moving to be amongst um, his people in the city, in the great city. But it slips. The oxen trip, and it starts to slip. And what does Uzzah do? He reaches out his hand to catch it. And he is instantly killed by God. Now, that is an entire message in its own. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But I just want to give you some background, because that sets our stage David's upset because this happened. Theologians say he's upset at God. Some say he was upset at Uzzah because Uzzah should have known better than to touch the Ark of the Covenant, etc. But we know that David is, is upset. And so what does he do? He has them take the Ark of the Covenant to the home of Obed-Edom. And it stays there for three months. Now, <clears throat> as a leader, I had to stop for a minute and do a little bit of analysis as to why David, as the leader of Israel, did not take responsibility for this, this Ark of the Covenant situation. Why did he leave it at someone else's house? It was almost as if he was saying, I don't want to touch it, you touch it. Well, we don't know for certain what he did, but it did stay in Obed-Edom's home for three months after that. And where our passage takes up is when they decide to move it again. And why did they decide to move it? Because Obed-Edom was getting blessed for having it in his home. So David possibly thought it was maybe safe now. Maybe it was okay to move it. 
And of course, as a leader, I'm thinking to myself, or did he just realize he, he wants some of that blessing? Um, now that God has decided he's going to bless Obed-Edom for having the Ark of the Covenant. We don't know for sure on that. But what we do know is that David is not taking any chances because when he gets to, when the, uh, the people carrying the ark of the Lord take six steps, he sacrifices a bull and a fattened calf. In, in essence, he, it's sort of a way of ensuring that they are doing everything correctly. It's also a way to offer worship to God. For the Jews, that was very appropriate in their worship. And then we see something else. We see that David dons a linen ephod. Now, I think we have a picture, maybe, of a linen ephod. There you go. That sort of vest-looking thing that sort of goes over the head, that's the linen ephod. And so you can imagine David, he is dancing to the Lord wearing this. Now, why would he be wearing this? He's the king. He is taking on the role of priest here. He is humbling himself because the priest's While they were to be honored, they weren't king. So he is humbling himself and putting on the linen ephod. Now, you could tell by what it covered that he, he was not necessarily naked. We're going to get into why she says that in a minute. But we also see this as a picture. He is a priest and a worshiper. He is also humbling himself to join the rest of the people in worship, rather than standing away from, he sets aside his kingly status. Who else do we know set aside his kingly status? Our Lord Jesus Christ did the same thing. Philippians 2 talks about that. It's very much like that. David decides that to worship God, you need to give up what you think is, makes you special. To worship God, you need to be one of the worshipers. And so he leads the worshipers as priests <clears throat> as well. But this is definitely a humbling of David. Now, it is about five kilometers that they travel from Obed-Edom's home into Jerusalem. And they are singing, they are celebrating, they're pl- it's, it's quite a party. Um, lots of trumpeting and shofars blowing and people dancing. Can you imagine? I know that's hard for us <clears throat> as Presbyterians. We don't do that kind of worship, do we? We do other things. But David saw this as an opportunity to worship God with abandon. He believed that God was worthy of everything we could give. Yes, our lives on a daily basis, but everything we could give in worship. Because we have to see God as who he is, holy, worthy of everything we can give him, even if it means we are embarrassed. How often do we avoid doing things because we're embarrassed to do them? And maybe God is tugging on us saying, Go talk to that person. Go say this or do this. Worship me. 
Do you ever feel that as we worship? That God is tugging on your heart to express your love for him in a different way, perhaps, or maybe in a more undignified way? Well, here David is doing this, and Michal is watching the parade coming in. It's a, it's a procession. It's this, you know, it, it, they didn't just slide in very quietly. No, no, no. It was a big party. There is, there is David dancing. And she's watching it from the palace window, and she is annoyed. No, she's not just annoyed. She despises David for it. Why do you think she despised David for this act of worship? Well, some would say she did not have the relationship with God that David did. And more than likely that that is part of it. But I think the other piece of it is the fact that she is the queen. And he is embarrassing her. How dare he humble himself? How dare he bring himself down to the level of the people? What does that look like for her if her husband is down with the people? And so she is annoyed. And David continues to worship. <clears throat> there have been prophets throughout the Bible who understood that celebration of God was absolutely necessary in order for them to just continue to go on. Jeremiah in Lamentations 3 says this. <clears throat> it's over here. He says this. I well remember them. My soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, my, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Jeremiah, the crying prophet... He had a good reason to cry. Knew that worshiping God, celebrating who he is, is absolutely necessary for life. He was downcast, but what happened when he started to remember who God was? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do we hear it that way? When we have <clears throat> difficult times in our lives, what is the first thing we want to do? If you ask me, I don't necessarily run and yell through my house, great is thy faithfulness. But I think that's what God would want for us, whether we feel like it or not. You don't have to feel like worshiping to worship God, because God does not change. He is still an awesome God, even in the difficult times. He is still who he is. And so Jeremiah knew that worshiping him made a difference Celebration was important. And of course, David, throughout the Psalms, celebrated God, even when things were difficult. Psalm 42 says this, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And he goes on, 
My soul is downcast within in me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. He is worshiping God even though his soul is downcast. It's almost as if he realizes that the only way to go up is to lift up his hand. Even if he is too weak to do it because things are hard. And then we move forward into where, G where David blesses the people and offices, offers sacrifices when they arrive in, in town. And he gives them gifts. He's so enamored of God that his, he's overflowing with generosity. He gives them <clears throat> uh, bread and dates and raisins and sends them home. And then he goes to his home and tries to, and, and goes to bless it. Doesn't try to, he goes to bless it. He walks in and his wife is annoyed. Can you imagine? Well, how do you do? Look how you have distinguished yourself among people. Don't you think you're special, in essence, is what she's saying there, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. When people don't understand your worship, they say things like that. What are you doing? It's almost as if they despise you for your worship. Now, there are folks that are worshiping this morning in ways that are different than how we worship, absolutely. But God receives our worship if it is truly worship of him. And that's what David is saying here. He says, it was before the Lord. Let's stop right there. It was before the Lord. It was not before the people. There's a difference. Worshiping to make people think you're really spiritual means nothing. But worshiping before the Lord where your focus is completely on the Lord and not on anything that's going on around you but it is a love letter of what's going on in your heart. Worship. Dancing. That's what David was experiencing. And he didn't care who saw him, you know. But as king, he should try to save face, right? No, David didn't see it that way. And then he pulls the king card. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. He chose me to be king. I should worship him. He is worthy of worship, whether I'm king or whether I am a slave. He is worthy of all of my worship. And then <clears throat> he's, he's kind of putting her in her place. I will celebrate before the Lord. Nothing you say will stop me. Nothing you say will stop me. I will become even more undignified than this. Oh, I bet she rolled her eyes at that moment. <clears throat> and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. I will be so undignified in my worship, undignified in quotes, that I will embarrass myself. I will go to a place of worshiping God with everything that I have, and I may embarrass myself. Have you ever done that? 
in your worship. I've seen people do things that are strange, but they are truly in that space where there's nobody but God in the room. And I love that. I love to see that. That warms my heart. That encourages my worship. And then he says, by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And that's what I'm talking about there. Those slave girls saw him dancing and they, he was dancing to God. And they can think everything, anything they want. But oftentimes, if there's someone that is truly seeking God and seeing you dancing, being undignified or whatever that's different perhaps, they are ministered to as well. Those slave girls were ministered to. And then, we don't know, but it appears that in verse 23, Michal was cursed possibly, because she had no children from then on to the day of her death. There's a couple of thoughts on that. One, she was cursed because she she questioned David's abandoned worship. Or, and it could be this as well, both, David no longer had intimacy with her. It appeared that there was a bit of a separation between them at this point. Celebrating God is for him. Worshiping him is for him. He's due all the worship, right? But it is just as much for us as well, not in a, well, I don't like the way they worship, so I'm just not going to go there. You know, take your toys and go home. But it's about what it does in us. Why do you think God commanded the people to celebrate all those festivals? Because it changes them. It helps them to express their love to him. Now, we all have people in our lives that we love. What would happen if you could never express your love for those people? It would be very, very difficult. It is good for us to express our love to God in celebration. It is good. It also reminds us of who we are. It also helps to give us balance, as our friend Tevia talked about. Balance in our lives. And as Jeremiah and David and many others realized worship of God pulls us up. It reminds us that we are worshipers and it brings us out of those deep depths that we can get into in our lives. We all have them because we live on this earth. And so, I want to share a story about a couple of Jewish families that I um, heard a speaker share, um, um, an American journalist shared this story. And it was in the 1990s when there were a lot of bombings and things going on in Israel, just kind of in random, what what appeared to be uh, random places. And this one particular place was at a bus stop. There was a a bomb that went off at a a bus stop in Jerusalem. And it killed two or three young people. They were waiting for the bus. They're probably in their um, late teens, early 20s. And it was during the time of preparation for Sukkot, which is the... um, Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. And so the family buried their children 
in 24 hours or so, which is kind of the Jewish custom. And they, set, they did set Shiva, which is um, the seven-day um, time of people coming and, and, and uh, giving their condolences and their encouragement to your home. But they continued their preparations for Sukkot, almost as if it did not happen. And what a strange thing, because I can tell you, if my children were murdered, I would not get out of bed. But because they understood that God has commanded these things be done, because it was tradition for them, and, and not tradition in a let's check it off our little list, but in this is how we worship God. Even in the midst of trial, they got up out of bed and they continued their preparations for Sukkot. Now, I'm not saying that <clears throat> tomorrow, if, I have, if any of us have something really tragic happen, that I'm going to judge you and say, well, why are you in bed? But what I am saying is that celebration to the Jewish people means something. <clears throat> it's not just God will be pleased, but God will be pleased. You see the difference? It's their love for God. Celebrating the Lord gives us air. It helps us breathe in the midst of hard things. And we need it, don't we? Even if you don't have anything tragic happening in your life right now, look at the news. Look at the people around you Tragic things are happening all the time. We have got to celebrate God. We have to. Because we, ha we are the people that they are going to look at for hope. We are hope bringers in the Lord. <clears throat> we must celebrate him. And that's why we're celebrating t this afternoon. We're celebrating that garden that God has given us that <clears throat> we were afraid the deer would eat. But the deer didn't eat it. Only a nibble. <laughs> but look at what it's still doing. And we're almost to October. We need to celebrate. We need to celebrate and so, <clears throat> this week, as we move into the routine of life, let's stop for a minute. Let's stop and breathe and recall the goodness. <clears throat> excuse me, the goodness of our God. Why we should worship him and then worship him. However that looks for you, we've all been made differently. But God wants our hearts because he loves us and he wants us to want him. And I know everyone in this room does. And the world will watch you celebrate God and wonder, where do they get that joy? And then you can say, because I know Jesus Christ, he saved me. So we're going to take a, just a minute before we jump into our last song, 
of silence. How is God tapping on your shoulder today? How can you be more undignified in your worship? In the way that the Holy Spirit is whispering to you. It doesn't have to be becoming undignified just to make it look like we're worshiping. It's becoming undignified because the Holy Spirit is saying, do it. Show me how much you love me. So let's take a moment and then we'll start our song.
again. Here is your blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son.